Well, good morning, and thank you all for coming, and thank you, Thomas, for organizing this very, very special event. To me, it's especially special, and I will explain in a few minutes why that's the case. Um, this is uh, a group that I really look forward to speaking to for a very long time um, because, like all of you, I share the type of experience, and my family did as well, the type of experiences you've had in coming to this country and taking advantage of the opportunities that this country affords. And I will describe a little bit of that in greater and more personal detail in a moment. But let me start out by giving a little bit of background as to why the notion of and the experience of diaspora is so important to this country from the very earliest history of the United States of America. In many, many ways, the diaspora experience has been America's experience. There was a wonderful book that perhaps some of you have read by an author named Russell Shorto. It was called The Island at the Center of the World. Uh, this was about Manhattan under the Dutch and just after it was transferred from the Dutch to the British. And at the time the Dutch ceded Manhattan, which is really all New York was then, it was really only New York south of Wall Street, in fact, there were only 400 inhabitants on the island, 400 inhabitants. And yet they were a very diverse group indeed. And in fact, those 400 people among them, they spoke 18 different languages. Um, they were, at that time, a microcosm of the much larger diaspora that was to follow. 17th century Manhattan, enriched by inhabitants from many parts of the world, was truly multi-ethnic and multicultural. Its citizens were creative and they were entrepreneurial. They valued free trade, they valued individual rights, they valued religious freedom, and they saw Manhattan as a place to come for opportunity. And this really embodies, in that little microcosm, a lot of things that happened to our country in subsequent years, decades, and centuries. Centuries later, this description of Dutch Manhattan not only fits New York City, which of course it does, but also the United States as a whole. Today, almost one quarter of Americans are first or second generation diasporians. In New York City, which is sort of my second city, although I live here in Washington, I've spent most of my time, adult life in New York, 41% of students in the city's schools speak a language other than English at home. Los Angeles has identified 109 different languages that students use at home. So American cities are very diverse places. But it's not just big cities like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. In many small and medium-sized towns in this country, one also sees people from various parts of the world speaking various languages, coming from different cultures. People who have migrated here from all over the world call America home and cherish their American citizenship. They also enrich our country in other ways. The creativity and success of Americans um, in a wide range of areas has been strengthened um, by the interaction among Americans when they come here. And indeed, the creativity and success of America has been strengthened by new waves of people who've come from distant lands to bring their talents, their hard work, their innovativeness, and the very backgrounds that they come from together to add dynamism to our country and to American society. My grandparents came from Eastern and Central Europe. Getting here wasn't easy. Neither was life when they first arrived. But America welcomed them and gave them opportunity. And they sought throughout their lives to give back to America for what it had given them. I like to feel that in some small way, in my current job as Under Secretary of State, I am following in their footsteps, trying to give back in gratitude for the welcome America gave them and the opportunity it has given them and it has given all of us. 
There are millions like me with similar stories. Many, many in this room can tell similar stories. And many Americans throughout this country, as I travel the width and breadth of America, have very similar stories. Let me now discuss the forum itself and some of the key elements that I think are important as we proceed. Uh, the, the forum itself is important for a variety of reasons. The goal is to underscore that in many ways, America's story is the world's story because the two are very, very caught up together and interactive in a variety of ways. The incredibly important role of the diaspora communities in America's success is well known, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But I also want to underscore that this is not a one-way street. Diasporians are our grassroots ambassadors. They offer unique expertise, insight, and personal commitment. Diasporians bring language and culture and familiarity with other parts of the world. Diasporians understand business opportunities and risks in their countries of origin. They are often members of large personal and professional networks with people of similar backgrounds. And they often return to countries of origin to tell people there about America. When they do, and when all of you do, because I know many, many of you do this, you were widely seen as credible and enthusiastic ambassadors of our country. And in many, many ways, the very best ambassadors of our country are not people who are professional ambassadors or professional diplomats. They're people whose origins are in another part of the world and go back and talk about America, talk about their experiences, talk about the values, talk about the opportunities of their country. There could be no finer representatives of the United States of America than all of you who go out and go back and interact through the internet or through conversations with people in your countries of origin or your family's countries of origin or areas uh, that embody your cultural heritage, even if it's decades ago. Just as importantly, many of you and many others who are participating in this diaspora movement or have participated are uniquely motivated because diaspora communities of origin are intrinsic and personal. Uh, they're not simply policy issues to you, they are personal issues in many cases. Supporting higher living standards, economic growth, and political stability in countries of origin or countries of heritage is about helping friends and families, helping villages, helping regions, helping people who need to understand America but can also benefit from the sorts of assistance and support that you and America can provide in often difficult times, times of flood, times of uh, major difficulties. A lot of you and a lot of your colleagues are there for them. Remittances are a basic connection and provide an important lifeline for millions of households around the globe. According to one institution, the Hudson Institute, in 2010, remittances from the United States to other countries total nearly $100 billion. Diaspora communities also provide critical business linkages to global markets, and this increasingly globalized world enables this to happen and enables more people to benefit from those sorts of interactions. And they help small uh, companies and large in those countries to benefit from all the opportunities of globalization. So many of you and many others are networkers with countries of origin or countries of heritage, and that in this increasingly global economy is extremely important. Diasporians are also important sources of innovation in America, and this story has been told time and time again. But it's important to remind ourselves of this. In the United States, immigrant-owned companies generate an estimated $67 billion in business each year. Strikingly, this is a number which surprised me when my colleagues told me about it. Strikingly, immigrants are 30% more likely to form new businesses than U.S.-born citizens. It's that desire, that creativity, 
the desire to move ahead. And that was the case of my grandfather. He came over speaking virtually no English and started a company on both sides, my mother's father's mother's side and my father's side. So this desire to start a business, to be innovative, to be entrepreneurial is, runs very deep and I'm sure it runs deep in this audience and in many other parts of this country. So there are a number of key elements in this. In 2011, in the spirit of this overall movement toward interaction and toward creativity, the State Department launched the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance, which is a large multi-stakeholder platform for partnership building with diaspora communities. This platform harnesses the investment power of more than 1,500 diaspora groups to promote innovation, entrepreneurship, and philanthropy in countries of heritage. It also seeks to strengthen our linkages in such areas as the sciences, medical research, and many, many other areas as well. Universities have long attracted the best scientific, medical, and engineering talent from around the world, and through them build partnerships to share and promote innovative ideas, medical cures, and cutting edge technology with their counterparts around the world. Just three very obvious examples, Albert Einstein, Andy Grove, and Sergey Brim. But if I looked at the telephone book of Palo Alto, or Cambridge, Massachusetts, or any other major center of excellence and intellectual ferment and activity, I would come up with thousands and thousands of names of a similar nature. In the United States, a quarter of foreign-born workers with college degrees are employed in the scientific and engineering professions. And we know in our country that these are professions that are very important to the future of the United States of America. They're very important to the future of innovation. They not only create new ideas and activities, they create jobs for future generations, for our children and our children's children. So having those people study these subjects, which are so important to modern 21st century society, is essential. The medical profession, as anyone knows who goes to a hospital in this country and goes to a research lab in this country, benefits from similar numbers. I, in my earlier life when I was in, in the private sector, was on the board of a biotech company and you see the researchers from all over the world coming to work together on cures, and not just in labs in the United States, but interaction between medical labs in this country and medical labs throughout the world. It's really inspirational. And this is where the cures of the 21st century are going to come from, not from any one country, but from a collectivity of people from various countries putting their minds, their talents, their creativity together. From 1990, to 2004, almost half, half of U.S. Nobel Prize laureates in science fields were immigrants. This is a striking number and it's a striking testimony to the creativity that you and your colleagues bring to this country. Many remain in close touch with their countries of origin and are powerful multipliers of diplomacy, development, medicine, and science. Nowhere is the role of diasporians more prominent than in Silicon Valley, the innovation capital of the world. 52%, fully 52% of all startups there have been founded by immigrants. Among US technology companies founded between 1995 and 2005, 25% had a chief executive or lead technologist who was foreign born. These companies generated $52 billion in revenue and employed 450,000 workers in 2005. So anyone who argues, anyone who argues that restricting immigration is a way of boosting jobs in this country is totally wrong and totally disproved by the facts. And this is a point I want to close with, but I want to emphasize now. We benefit from the hard work, the minds, the creativity, and the talents of people who come in here. We should have an open door to people who want to come, work hard, innovate, raise their families in this country, and participate in the American dream. That not only benefits the people who come, it benefits 
large numbers of other people. It creates jobs. It doesn't destroy them. It creates value. It doesn't destroy value. It adds to opportunity in this country. And if we're going to be an opportunity to society and a beacon to the world, then an open immigration policy, as open as possible, is essential. And I will tell you a little story from Lee Kuan Yew. Many of you may be familiar with Lee Kuan Yew, who really started Singapore and is one of the great minds of our times. And I once asked him, do you think America is in decline? Because there was this notion America is in decline. He said, I don't think America is in decline. I said, what, what would be a signal to you that America is heading for decline? He said, one thing. And that is, if you start closing your doors to the best and the brightest and the hardest working people all around the world who want to come to the United States, that will be a signal to me that you're headed in the wrong direction. And I think we ought to bear that in mind when we have debates over immigration, we have debates on these issues. An open door to people from around the world is the best guarantee of continuing a dynamic American society and a dynamic American economy. And I believe this, and I think this is something people in Washington particularly should not lose sight of as we engage in these debates. But I will end on that note because I think it's so important and it's such an important message for all of us to understand. I don't need to explain it to this audience, but I do think it's something we all need to explain to the American people. Let me cite a couple of examples, uh, although there are many that I could cite. But in the interest of time, there are a couple that are, that are interesting to me, but as I say, there are many, many more examples. First, I'd like to mention uh, Dr. Wole Shobunyejo, a Nigerian-American professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Princeton. I actually taught at Princeton, and so I have a particular interest in someone who's working at Princeton and doing brilliant work at Princeton. He splits his time between research in the United States and his role of president of the African University of Science and Technology in Abuja. Investments like his in Nigeria's engineering talent are facilitating cutting-edge innovation that will benefit both Africa, the United States, and the world. I'm delighted that he is here today with us to share his story, and I believe you'll be hearing from him later. Perhaps you've heard from him already, but it's one interesting and very powerful example. Another diaspora innovator is Ashwarya Ratan, um, who has worked on optimizing data entries for local microcredit co-ops in India, and who presented on behavioral insights um, on the question of financial inclusion at the Google Solve X session, I believe that was yesterday. Her system holds tremendous promise in India and other developing countries. Indeed, microfinance co-ops serve currently 86 million households in India. Improving record keeping could help to expand borrowing from banks to far more people down the road. Ratan's pay job is director of micro savings and payments innovation initiatives at Yale. So I want to thank her for her efforts and for her uh, distinguished service to India and to the United States. So uh, Dr. Ratan, who, if you're here, I don't know if you're still here, but if you are, I want to say thank you very much for what you're doing. And I know millions of people in India and around the world, people who will benefit from this technology, will also be very grateful to you. Let me also uh, describe a few other aspects of diaspora networks. These two cases show how, on a personal level, members of the diaspora can make a big difference. There is also a lot of work underway at the State Department and USAID to facilitate connections between diaspora groups and to increase your impact on development. Last year at this forum, we announced a new initiative called Networks of Diasporas for Engineers and Scientists, or what is known as NODES, N-O-D-E-S. This is a partnership between the Department of State, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the National Academies of Science, which are actually right across the street from this very building. The basic idea is quite simple, to connect diaspora scientists across boundaries by fostering knowledge networks, the sharing of best practices, the identification of capacity building tools, 
and the creation of links between professional societies, universities, NGOs, and government agencies at home and abroad. In the past year, NOTICE convened scientists and diaspora groups from more than 30 countries around the world at the nation's largest scientific meeting and built a set of knowledge resources that we are sharing with this rapidly expanding network. And this is a very dynamic group of people from all over the world. Many diaspora communities are also ramping up their programs to create positive change. In the past year, a number of diaspora communities have hosted conferences and diaspora forums. Among others, Jamaicans, Albanians, Haitians, and Ghanaians have held forums aimed at engaging and recognizing their diaspora communities. Governments are also getting into the act and playing a more constructive role. Last July, under the leadership of a very good friend of mine, in Indonesia's very distinguished ambassador to the United States of America, Dino Jalal, and I think Dino is present here today. There's Dino. Stand up, Dino. Dino is one of the great... <laughs> Dino is a great friend, a great human being, and representing a great country in the United States. Um, and we spent a lot of time together, uh, not just on professional issues, but as friends in discussing the world and discussing our lives. Dino, uh, as a dynamic leader of the Indonesian community here and as Indonesia's ambassador, hosted the Indonesian embassy's effort to organize the first ever Congress of Indonesian Diasporians in Los Angeles. So I want to thank you for that. And it's a real mark of leadership, and I think Others who are interested in pursuing this kind of model, I think, could learn a lot. And Dino is a great teacher, so he will be, I'm sure, available to provide his insight to others as well. The State Department has worked hard over the past couple of years to strengthen the links between the American diaspora communities from the Middle East countries. And I want to pay uh, a particular amount of attention to this because of what's going on in the Middle East and because I believe that it is extremely important for this country to understand better what is going on in the region and to play a constructive role as the region tries to work its way through very difficult problems. And who can do that better and who can help us to understand it better than people whose backgrounds are those of the same people who are actively involved in events in the Middle East, people who come from the region or whose parents have come from the region or who trace back to the communities in places like Egypt, Jordan, North Africa, and other parts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there is a huge resource here. Just as one example, there are 200,000 Egyptians living in the United States, creative people involved in finance, involved in engineering, involved in science, a Nobel Prize winner. Many, many people who are enormously supportive of development and efforts and research and creativity in the United States, and they can play a very important role in helping the new Egypt, the post-revolutionary Egypt, to address some of the problems it faces. The potential of these diaspora communities is vast. It goes beyond serving as a source uh, for remittances. Remittances, obviously, are important, but they're not the only things. Uh, these people are also critical sources of investment capital and business skills that many Middle East countries in transition need to tap in order to place themselves on a sustainable path to development. Diaspora communities are also contributing by way of volunteerism. These communities volunteer their time and they volunteer their expertise. And they are currently thinking through additional ways to partner with various organizations to amplify volunteer efforts by diaspora communities from the Middle East in order to scale up and strengthen capacity building in the region and across a number of key areas, including economic development and civil society. There is a critically important confidence element as well. And I think that while numbers measure certain things, confidence is a very important part of building the new Middle East as well. We have encouraged the governments of the region to reach out to their diaspora communities in this country, to encourage them to do business and invest in their countries of origin or their countries of cultural heritage. If they succeed in those countries, the impact on confidence could be very large, 
as markets around the world see overseas investors as those most knowledgeable about these countries investing their funds, others will be more inclined to invest their funds if the communities that come from those countries or whose parents or grandparents come from those countries invest. That is a key signal to other investors to do the same thing. So it's a very important part of confidence building. In addition, the scientific diaspora to the United States can be especially helpful in maintaining contacts with scientific communities in their countries of origin or countries of heritage. For example, and this is a number which is a very powerful one, there are 470,000 Iranians who are living in the United States. The Iranian diaspora have contributed significantly to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences workshop and uh, this is a process of not just a workshop in a given year but a multitude of workshops taking place over many years and this is uh, an effort for the American scientific community and the Iranian scientific community to work together in a number of areas. These workshops have covered topics of benefit to both countries including foodborne diseases, water conservation, reuse, and recycling, ecology of the Caspian Sea, drought forecasting and management, and improving earthquake mitigation. Moreover, the premier scientific and technological university in Iran has more alumni in California than in any other part of the world. This is one of the most meaningful ways of maintaining links between the United States and Iran today. In addition to our global information through science and technology initiative, um, there are also members of our groups who are serving in a very specific capacity, such as Faisal Sohail, a venture capitalist with ties to Saudi Arabia, who provides advice and guidance to aspiring young entrepreneurs throughout the Middle East as well as to Africa and Asia. So we find people who are part of these communities who make that extra effort to do an outreach to their countries of origin or countries of cultural heritage, but also since they understand the world well, they reach out even beyond that. So let me conclude with a few parting thoughts. Deepening and expanding diaspora networks can do much to make America more responsive and more effective as a leader around the world, and more knowledgeable about cultures and communities outside of our borders. We can develop stronger bonds with other nations through their civil societies, through their business leadership, through their religious communities, through women's groups who are seeking to play a greater role in many societies, and in many cases have been deprived of that role, and minority groups who also are trying to play a greater role as democratization begins to move in more countries to make sure that their voices are heard, to strengthen the role of inclusivity in these other countries and help the leaders in these countries, the emerging leadership in these countries to understand that inclusivity, inclusivity of women, inclusivity of minorities, inclusivity of uh, religious groups of all kinds is part of the way you develop, part of the way you utilize your creativity. And the United States, a society which is from the beginnings of, of early Manhattan, has been a society of inclusivity and opportunity, far from perfect. We have a long way to go. But we're a very good model for at least demonstrating that inclusivity is an important part of economic growth, of political opportunity, and of the dynamism of our, of our society. So while we can learn and while we can do better, the general notion of inclusivity is a very important part of our economy. It's not something separate. It's not something separate from our politics. It's not something separate from our, uh, from our econ economic growth. It is an intrinsic and essential and central part of that. This forum, in many ways, is a celebration of America's diaspora communities. It is our hope that by bringing you together, we will create new opportunities for partnership with the private sector, with civil society, and with public institutions in order to make your engagements with your countries of origin or heritage effective, scalable, and sustainable at levels even beyond those that take place today. And there's a lot going on today that 
many of you are very aware of and many of you are very active engaged in. So we want to try to help to enhance the process that is already underway and the process that you are already engaged in. When I walk down the streets of my other hometown, New York City, as I did with a friend this last weekend, and I love to do, I'm always proud to see so many people from different cultures, different countries, different ethnicities living together, walking the streets together, talking together, dining together, and working together. It makes me proud that America attracts and welcomes so many people from so many parts of the world. We should celebrate our diversity because that is what in many ways makes us American. It also makes me proud when I see the contributions that wave after wave of immigrants have made in this country. And to conclude on a point that I mentioned a few moments ago, for America to remain the world's beacon, as well as its most dynamic economy and society, we need to keep our doors open. We need to invite, welcome, and indeed honor those from around the world who want to come here to build a new life, who want to build new businesses, engage in the creation of new technologies, and contribute to our medical science, and who want to work hard and make our nation a better place for themselves and increase opportunities for their children today and tomorrow and for many, many decades to come. People who seek opportunities and come here, that is really what America should stand for at home and abroad. So many before us, before me, my grandparents, before all of us have done this, it is in our nation's interest that others have the opportunity to secure the kinds of benefits and the opportunities that this country can afford them. So I look at the fact that we have an opportunity in this country to forge policies that are even more inviting to people who want to come here and open opportunities for those people, I think is going to be and should be a hallmark of our future. And if we're smart and we understand what makes us the country we are and what contributes to the dynamism that we have had over decades, keeping an open door to opportunity and turning away from those who argue for restrictions or for other types of limits um, that, in fact, will impede growth, improve, impede job creation, and impede opportunity, we ought to be very vigilant about those arguments and counter them whenever we can, because America is built on the people who are seated in this room and many, many others who have contributed to our country in so many ways, culturally, economically, politically, and in many other areas. So, in behalf of the Department of State of the United States, I welcome your ideas and I welcome your support for this growing partnership. I'm delighted that you have come here. I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak before you. I commend you for your interest in this subject. I commend you for your leadership. I commend you for the vision and the vigor and the energy and the commitment that you have given to this country. I thank you for joining us. I'm honored to be here and I wish you a good day. Thank you very much.